The best thing we can do today is, as a nation, turn to God. Now, not foolishly and think that, well, pestilences will not touch us because look at us. We gathered when everyone else is not. Now, there's evidence that pestilences and microbes, they impact believers just like they do non-believers. The difference will be, what will the believer do? What will be, what will be the response of a God-fearing people? Well, they won't, be, they won't be arrogant. They won't be ignorant of the, of, the, of the real danger that exists. They'll exercise with caution, care, and understanding. We'll be agents of mercy and grace toward each other. Is this, I mean, this, this begs the question, is this a judgment from God? And then it begs the question, if it is, then what would the judgment be for? And then, if we know what the judgment is for, what will be our response? If we're going to be consistent, then let's let Scripture be the lamp. Again, we asked the question earlier, what, what does judgments from God look like? They look like floods and famines and plagues and disease and pestilences and tempests and storms raging and natural disasters. Well, there's no mistaking when we read about these things in Scripture that these are things that, one, we can argue at some level, they are naturally occurring events. But if that's all we treat them as, we have essentially relegated God to a non-essential element in any day. If, a, if, a, if an eruption of a volcano is just an eruption of a volcano, then we've relegated God off to the corner as a non-essential. It's not something God caused, and so it's not something we should cry out to God to help us with. Or we're treating it in this position that it is not a natural occurring event, and thus we treat God as, well, we'll get through this eventually if we just follow all these safety precautions. Arguing we need to carry on in a precariously cautious people, but never at the expense of ignoring God. What does, the, what does the world need in a day like this? The world needs a prophetic word from God. The world, the community that we live in, just shouldn't treat this as some kind of an inconvenient matter for a few days or for a few weeks or for a few months. If we don't stop and ask the questions along the way, we will miss altogether what God is wanting to do for His glory in a day like this. He puts the suffering, He puts all of the wrath, of all of the sin of, of man upon His Son on the cross and He pours out His wrath on Him. It looks grotesque. We can't even look at it. We, we're, we're shameful of it. But He's doing all of this for, for the display of His glory that God and only God can save us. Worse than, worse than strong words of judgment from God is no word at all. I, I think that we must not forget this. Worse than a faithful heralding of the truth of God's Word is a day when there is no word from God. Look at the nations now. Who among the nations is pointing to this crucified Christ who took on the sins of the world. Who in this world is pointing to the resurrected Christ, the triumphant Almighty God, who not only conquered sin, or took on the sins of humanity, but conquered it by raising from the grave. Is this a judgment of God? You might be asking. You might be leaning in to hear, what will the preacher say, is it? I certainly think we, need, we must not, not think about this. I think it would be foolish of us if we answered too quickly either way. But this is for sure, I think we should ask the question. 
Which then begs the follow-up question, as I stated earlier, if so, then what would this judgment be for? What kind of national sins? And I think this is how we need to look at this. Not just as personal sins. And listen, by the way, every one of these national sins have the ability to be personal sins. And every personal sin ought to be personally repented of. When there are national sins, the biblical instruction is that nations repent. Corporate bodies repent. We can see there, it's Joseph Aline in his book, the Puritan writers of that era wrote so prolifically on these kinds of things and, and observing things from their vantage point of their day. Joseph Aline in his series of sermons called Alarm to the Unconverted. Where he's basically just making a large argument. Here's the evidence of how unconverted you are. Here's evidence of how far from God you've become. When there's not just personal covetousness, but when there's national covetousness, one should expect to see a judgment from God upon a nation. Not just when there's individual or personal immorality, but when there's national immorality, one should expect by the evidence of Scripture that there should be at some point a national judgment from God upon the national sin of immorality. Not just personal drunkenness, but when there is national drunkenness, not to say that one is worse than another. We deal with the, we'll deal with the individual, with the personal, just like we would with the national. The individual should repent of his drunkenness, just as a nation should repent of her drunkenness. Just as an individual should repent of his love for luxury and his love for pleasure, a nation should repent of her love for luxury and her love for pleasure over God. Just as an individual should repent for his lack of honoring God, nations who do not honor God must soon look, where will the judgment of God come? Which then follows, if it is the judgment of God, what would be the right response to give at a time like this? Well, both personally, corporately, community-wise and national-wise, and certainly today, global-wise. We must consider our ways. You see, our response to God is no different today than it is in a day of, of great prosperity. We look at ourselves and we see, we consider our ways. We humble ourselves. We repent of our undoing sins. We pray and we repent. In, in our repenting, we pray and we ask God to help us because we cannot save ourselves. Just as an individual should put himself toward godliness, so too should nations aim toward godliness. My prayer for us today as we observe and consider this suffering servant observations of what Isaiah is seeing and there the disfigurement of our Messiah is of such a grotesque position that he is despised and forsaken and it wouldn't be a, a true assessment of today that Christ is largely despised and forsaken today he's a man of sorrow and he's acquainted with grief he's like one of whom we should hit our hide our face from he was despised, and we did not esteem him. When you find yourself as an individual or as a family despising and not esteeming God in the right place in which he should be, then look to God for forgiveness. Church, whenever you find yourself not esteeming God properly, repent of that and turn to God. That being because God has established you to be the pillar of and the buttress of truth. And when we're not in that position, God forgive us. And may He reestablish us as that position in the community. And then, as well, to the nations of the world. You look 
Over the history of the world and at times, you can see that the Spirit of God moves at different times and in different lands, in different, in different places, in different circumstances. But it's clear of this. We don't see any great awakening of God take place until first there's been a revival of God's people. We should not expect to see anything different in our day if we do not soon see the church different and treating and esteeming God differently than we currently have been. Oh, it is for the grace of God that I've come today to encourage you to go forth from here and be the church. Do so with joy in this day. Be the peculiar people that Peter describes you as. All of the world looks around them and you see there's sounds of despair. There's alarming of this and frightenings of that. I say to you, go forth as one who's looked at the cross. You see the price of your sin. And in that you've seen the glorious redeem redemption of Christ. His saving work and the triumphant work that he has through the resurrection. For God's glory, go forth as this kind of church in this kind of day. Do not take your eyes off of this suffering servant today. And I say the same to those who are in their homes today. Give you the same encouragement that you exist and you, you, you go forth in this day just like you would in any day. Careful, cautious, but displaying the kindness of God in all of our circumstances. We give grace to each other. We applaud each other for behaving this way and that way when they're prudent and respectful and, and obvious of the day and all of our individual circumstances. But all of this to understand there is also something of a mighty peculiarness of God that an assembly of God's people would take place in awareness of the day in which they're in. So may God bless you. May God bless your household. Oh, but may God bless his church with a kindness that leads us to repentance that would cause us to advance the gospel in this day, just like now.